2020. The last time we had this briefing was on Monday, and um, today is the second. This is the second one for the week. Now I'll be calling on the national, uh, on the chairman of the presidential task force to deliver his remarks. After which we'll take the updates from the Minister of Health, the DG and CDC and the national coordinator before we take your questions. And I now invite the chairman of the presidential task force on COVID-19 to the podium to deliver his remarks. DSGF. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, gentlemen of the press, let me welcome you uh, from a very long break. I hope you had a, a wonderful weekend of celebration and to thank you for your patience. Uh, today, the 11th June 2020, uh, national uh, briefing, Nigeria witnessed a spike in number of confirmed cases when the number recorded jumped to 663 on Tuesday, 9 June, 2020. This number gives us cause for concern as a task force and as a nation. In the presidential task force briefing on Monday, 8th June 2020, I emphasized that a great majority of Nigerians are still susceptible to COVID-19 and cautioned that if we allow it to transmit easily between us. It may be even, even more deadly. That admonition remains very valid and we still underscore vigilance and self-preservation. The Presidential Task Force continues to monitor the level of activities and compliance with the guidelines nationwide. Consultations will continue, and tonight I will be holding another round of video conference with the theme of governance appointed by the National Economic Council to interface with the PTF. The Presidential Task Force will re-emphasize its appeal to governments at the sub-national level as well as our security agencies to enforce the guidelines and protocols family. The Presidential Task Force would also be meeting with the heads of these agencies to further fine-tune strategies to ensure compliance. This afternoon, the Presidential Task Force met with the House of Representatives Ad Hoc Committee on COVID-19. The interaction was robust and we received assurances that the legislative support required will be given to help us overcome this pandemic. Similarly, we are pleased to inform you that His Excellency, Mr. President, held a video conference meeting with the President of the ECOWAS in his capacity as the ECOWAS champion for co the control of COVID-19. During the conference, matters pertaining to regional response to the pandemic were discussed. Specifically, such matters include our common risk as a sub-region, the need for our collaboration in response, our interdependence, and Nigeria's role given our large population and the position of Mr. President as ECOWAS champion. Tomorrow, Nigeria will be celebrating Democracy Day. The Presidential Task Force urges that we should celebrate in solemn and reflective manner. We must ensure that our goal is to stay alive and remain COVID-19 free. Let the dead be a reminder of the realities of our times, the disruptive effects of COVID-19, the realization that we are faced with a new normal and the necessity for us to individually and collectively 
prepare ourselves to come cover this pandemic. The best celebration we would be quit ourselves is to strengthen our individual and collective resolve to abide by the guidelines to protect ourselves, our friends, our loved ones, and the country at large. The Presidential Task Force has advanced in its preparation for taking precision measures within the high burden local government areas identified in our previous briefing. The strategy will be unfolded in due course. We are also emphasizing risk communication and community engagement in a sustainable manner. We therefore urge state governments to reach out to traditional religious and community leaders for dialogue and education. The major message will be ownership, behavioral change, and taking responsibility. I now call on the Honorable Minister of Health and subsequently the DG Nigeria Center for Disease Control and the National Coordinator who would update you before we take questions. I thank you for listening. Director General, Permanent Secretaries, Directors, ladies and gentlemen, we all are constantly reviewing COVID-19 activities and developments at home and abroad to learn as much as we can about this novel coronavirus disease. We have learned a lot, and among what we have learned, for example, is that patients are most infectious during that asymptomatic period after they are diagnosed and spread the virus even when they do not look or feel sick or even if their symptoms will appear later, they are already spreading the virus. We also learned that patients who have no symptoms at all, or who have no symptoms but have been sick, uh, may no longer be infectious after 14 days even if their PCR tests identify RNA evidence of the virus in their system. This is, of, of course, those which are, who are diagnosed positive and they are asymptomatic. The, those with symptoms will continue to receive treatment for the number of uh, days that they are clinically unstable. Global evidence shows that up to 45% of infected persons may have no symptoms at all. In Nigeria, the proportion of confirmed cases that is symptomatic compared to asymptomatic is about 40 to 60, respectively, which means that if 10 persons are able to infect you with COVID-19, four of them will look very well, indeed. Another three or four of them will have mild symptoms that can be trivialized even by healthcare workers who have experience, and that is perhaps a possible reason for initial relatively high rate of infection among workers. Therefore, the cheapest and easiest way to protect oneself is with a mask. In this case, a cloth mask, not necessarily a medical mask, but you must also make clear that that alone does not do the trick. You must still maintain other measures that are advised, distancing, hand washing, and respiratory hygiene. And this is why the constant Federal Ministry of Health constantly urges citizens to adhere strictly to all these guidelines, wearing masks when outside your home, and also to all the other non-pharmaceutical measures, especially since the confirmed COVID-19 cases in our country is continuing to rise very slowly, which also gradually increases the number of persons in society who may be positive, they may have symptoms, they'll be in hospital or they have no symptoms in the community. 
Yesterday, we had 409 new COVID-19 uh, uh, confirmed cases, which increased the total tally to 13,873. We have successfully treated and discharged 4,351 persons, and unfortunately lost 382 Nigerians to this disease. Although these numbers are only creeping up compared to other countries, and the case fatality rate hovers around 3%, we are concerned and at high alert. We have no room for complacency or overconfidence, and we need to be ready for any sudden shift in fortune. The Federal Ministry of Health, through the NCDC, is activating additional laboratories in Akwaibom, Jigawa, and Oyo states, which brings the total number of laboratories in the network to 33. More are being prepared as we work towards a target of at least one molecular laboratory per state. Optimization of some laboratories is also going on. We are planning for targeted community sensitization activities, especially in 20 high burden local government areas with sensitization workshops on infection prevention and control for healthcare workers, both in public and private hospitals, uh, particularly here in the FCT. The Federal Ministry of Labor and Employment, the Federal Ministry of Health, and the House of Representatives, led by the Honorable Speaker, have been engaging the National Association of Resident Doctors to address issues raised by uh, young doctors. We have had dialogues with them and with other government um, agencies and ministries, and also with health-related associations. The dialogue addressed issues on welfare allowances for healthcare for frontline healthcare workers and redressed issues on personal protective equipment which have been supplied to all states and to federal teaching institutions uh, for the safety of our healthcare workers. These engagements have been productive and I'm confident that our resident doctors shall show understanding and reciprocate the efforts that have been made to address these grievances. The issue about JOS uh, resident doctors has been resolved by the board, and uh, the remaining are uh, being uh, as much as I know, I think, already in the process or in the pipeline. I wish to thank the honorable speaker Right Honorable Fevin Bajamia Mila and the Minister of Labor, Dr. Chris Ngige, for their commitment in ensuring industrial harmony in the health sector. I would like to use this opportunity to also inform stakeholders and the general public that the much awaited reforms for operationalizing the Basic Health Care Provision Fund is about ready after a period of time in which we had to carry out certain corrections which were pointed out by lawmakers. This will be revealed after presentation to stakeholders in the shortest possible time. However, I can see that all er errors in the manual have been addressed and corrected, and the new document vastly improves on the earlier one with regard to service delivery package and other features. Finally, I wish to urge everyone to be your brother's keeper, to always wear your mask in the public, observe hand and respiratory hygiene, and do not go out of your house unless it is absolutely necessary. This advisory is particularly important for vulnerable persons and persons over the age of 60, that they should stay in their homes unless there is something absolutely necessary that they have to attend to personally. Thank you for your attention.
Honourable Ministers, Gentlemen of the Press. Good evening. Uh, today we'll talk about two important topics. One is of the increase in numbers that you've all seen um, uh, happen as we report new cases every evening. As we have eased the restrictions that we um, instituted across the country and our states ease those restrictions. We have expected the numbers to increase and we have announced this severally to expect an increase in numbers. So this increase in numbers is not unusual. There are always a few weeks lag and as we increase testing and ease the lockdown, this is a virus that goes from one individual to the other. Therefore, it is most likely that we will see an increase in numbers. Whether that increase continues or not depends on our collective action like we've always said. And sometimes these numbers are necessary to remind us of that reality. While the numbers of debt as a proportion might appear small, these are all people that many of us have gotten to know and every day you get to hear about one other friend or relative that unfortunately has passed away. So these numbers are important. Um, we see a lot of suspicion around the numbers. We sometimes wonder, um, the people saying that, are they not watching what is happening across the world? Um, are we all collectively with India, Brazil, the US, the UK, is there some form of global collaboration uh, to deceive Nigerians? It's not the case. This is the reality of what we face. And we have to come together to address this. Continue to address this as, as we have been. The other topic that has been receiving global attention is something called contact tracing. This is an activity carried out by public health workers at the state level in every state in Nigeria, but really carried out across the world. It's one of the key strategies to, in the control of any infectious disease. Now, when the chains of transmission are easier to define, such, like, such as an Ebola outbreak, where everybody that gets the infection ultimately becomes ill, that activity is a lot more defined, narrow, and specific. In a disease like COVID-19, where 80% of the people are asymptomatic, sometimes it's difficult to say exactly from whom or at what time you got this virus. And this is a very difficult process if, you have been, if contact tracing has been carried out on you, because you then wonder, where did you get it? Who did you touch? Where did you touch? From who might you have gotten this virus? It's also difficult for the people doing this. For four months now, people leave their homes every morning, going out to do contact tracing, <laughs> with no end in sight, with new numbers increasing every day. So really, the task for the public health workforce, they have their tasks really cut out for them as they do this. Across the world, there are consultations on how we can do this better. Can apps help? Can technology help? Can social sciences help? Can our ability to interact with people better? Our ability to speak the language that people speak, uh, to communicate with them more effectively, to ask them questions. How do I deal with the stigmatization? of when public health workers come to your house and ask you questions on who you might have been in touch with. How do we deal with that? And states have been doing this differently. Some states now use completely unmarked vehicles so that people don't feel stigmatized when public health workers come to them. So there are no easy solutions. What we've been doing with states is to come up with key performance indicators for all contacts being traced following up how many contacts are traced for every new case. We have already seen that the states with the most number of cases, Lagos, FCT, and Kano, are struggling the most to do, 
to follow all the contacts. Because the more cases you have, the larger the number of contacts you have to follow every day. So right now, the case to contact ratio is smallest in the states with a lot of cases. And they are really struggling to keep up. And this is really to encourage them across the country to keep pushing in this direction. One important uh, group of stakeholders to help us reduce the stigma are religious and cultural leaders, traditional leaders across the country. This week, uh, Dr. Liu and I had the privilege of meeting the traditional leaders of the FCT. They all came in their mass ready to take on the responsibility of communicating to their people the challenges that we are facing and how we will collectively respond to this. This is really what we are encouraging every state across the country to bring in a diverse set of voices to preach, to confirm to people the challenges that we face, that these are real, nobody is making them up, there are people behind those numbers and we need to come together to do what we have to do to reduce transmission. So on that note, over the next few weeks, we will be working very hard to improve contact tracing across the country, both with technology, with sociology, using the leaders, all the leaders that we have in our society. And on that note, I wish you a happy Democracy Day tomorrow. Let's work hard to protect the democracy we fought so hard to get. Thank you very much. Uh, members of the PTF, uh, gentlemen of the press, uh, good evening. Uh, today I would like to first of all talk about um, the issue of behavioral change. Um, as we know, the East uh, lockdown that we've just gone into was done partly for the purpose of um, gradually reopening our economy. And it is also evident though that in other countries, just like in Nigeria, that easing the lockdown could result in a significant increase in the number of COVID-19 infections, and indeed we are seeing that. Um, thanks to the collective effort of our partners, the private sector, donor organizations, and concerned citizens, we continue to do a lot of sensitization work around this. And um, the recent findings from the NOI national poll has shown that about 98% of Nigerians are aware of COVID-19. 55% uh, of Nigerians have received uh, messages on COVID-19 from uh, government sources. 51% um, believe that they can differentiate fake news uh, from official news items as it relates to COVID-19. 90% of respondents trust the messages received regarding COVID-19 from genuine sources. 98% have received messages on preventive measures and the same proportion have received messages on what to do if they develop symptoms. 93% of respondents intend to adhere to the message, but intention is not the same as action, as we can see. We know that the data shows that knowledge is not being translated to a change in behavior. Clearly, it is one thing for us to be aware, but it is another thing to actually act on our knowledge. And this is what we are finding within the response. So we are appealing to the public to please change um, our behavior in order to save lives. This is clearly a call to action to translate knowledge to life-saving um, action and infection prevention. It is very clear that we are, the public in general, uh, are not adhering strictly to the preventive measures against uh, this virus. Um, and this is shown clearly in our behavior, despite the fact that we, we do have the knowledge to protect ourselves. But of course, sometimes it is human. It is human nature. Now, to, to, to stick to what we are used to. But um, in, in our view, we do not have the luxury of ignoring these um, risks. Therefore, if we are going to walk, if we are going to the market, the farm, the church, or the mosque, we must remember to translate the knowledge we have of wearing masks, of washing our hands, 
of physical distancing and other advisories to action. The PTF, together with other partners, have circulated health protocols and guidelines widely. These have been shared across digital space, the social media, the print media, and also at the grassroots through thousands of community volunteers, mobilizers, and influencers. As the world continues to look for a permanent solution to the epidemic, we must not give the virus the opportunity to win this war. We must not make it easy for the virus to spread. I would also like to briefly, I know the DG and CDC has talked about stigma, but uh, I just want to briefly re-echo um, our concern with the ongoing issues of uh, stigma against uh, people who have COVID-19 or have even recovered from COVID-19. There's no doubt that uh, stigma and discrimination makes our job very difficult when it comes to identifying persons with COVID. There's also no doubt based on the science that if you recover from COVID, you are not a risk to anybody in the community. We have to change the way we um, relate to people who have COVID or those who have recovered from it. I am very certain that none of those who have had COVID intentionally went out to seek COVID-19. And therefore, to a large extent, it is not within our power to resist it unless we take those actions that are necessary within the guidelines to protect ourselves. There are over 6.8 million COVID-19 cases worldwide and we already have more than 13,000 cases also in Nigeria. Therefore, for those that are saying that COVID is not real, for those that are saying that COVID is fake, I would say that 6.8 million people worldwide cannot be wrong. It is also insensitive to the memory of those who died. COVID is very much around, it's very much with us. The risk has not gone away and we are appealing to the public to continue to take those preventive measures to make sure that they are safe. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Nancy Oyedia Orum from AIT. I want to start with you, Mr. Chairman. I remember on this platform you have appealed to private and uh, public hospitals not to reject patients of whatever, whatsoever ailment. Now, let me paint this scenario. I got a call from a medical practitioner who told me that he referred a patient from his private hospital to the national hospital here in Abuja. The national hospital looked at the patient and said, well, your condition is COVID-19 related. We cannot accept you. This patient went back to the private hospital. The private hospital had to take him back in their ambulance to the national hospital. Well, after the back and forth, this guy was rejected and he went back home. Eventually, the next day, this guy died. Another scenario, sir, a woman had stroke in Lagos State. Seven hospitals rejected her, including the Lagos State University Chin Hospital. This woman was depressed. Eventually, she died. The third case, sir, permit me to say this one. A pregnant woman that was discharged from a hospital went back home three days after she was discharged, she had complications. She went back to the hospital where she was discharged. The hospital rejected her just three days after. Now, this brings me to my question, sir. Are there punitive measures for both private public hospitals who are rejecting patients and who eventually die in this process? Are there punitive measures for these hospitals? And secondly, the second lecture to that question is, is there a channel where some of these members of the public can explore, maybe to report some of these cases to the PTF or the federal government? So I don't know if you would like to react to that. So, okay. So my second question uh, was supposed to be for the Minister of Interior, but he's not here. Uh, maybe you, you will take that question up. <laughs> okay, before COVID-19, sir, there was a training for uh, newly recruits for, for staff who will be working at the 
correctional centers. There was a training that was ongoing in Lagos before the COVID-19 started. So because of COVID, they were told to go back to their destination. Now, these guys have received messages to return back to camp for the completion of that training. At this time, when Lagos is the hub of this virus, what assurance are we giving these people of uh, their health? And finally, to the DG NCDC. Well, I must commend you because I had a colleague who is in one of your isolation centers here in Abuja. And the place is top notch because I had to do a video call with her. But it brings me to my question, post COVID-19, what happens to these isolation centers? Are they going to become full-fledged hospitals? I don't know. Thank you. Good afternoon all. Rachel Abuja from the News Agency of Nigeria. My first question is to the Minister of Health. Sir, you just made mention of the basic health care provision phone. I would like to know what the error we are looking at in this um, operational manual because it's taking so long and we now have another committee on this same manual. What's really the problem? We're actually fighting an unseen war and we really need the basic health care provision that it is. My last question, sir, beyond the training of trainers that was done to um, scale up the, or let's say support the primary healthcare centers across Nigeria. I would like to know how equipped these primary healthcare centers are as at today to support the response for, against um, community spread. My last question is um, to the DG and CDC. Sir, where is the country today in achieving target set um, on the national testing um, strategy uh, and what's our new daily testing capacity as of today since we now have 33 uh, labs in our network and how many tests can we do per day at the moment my last question is to the coordinator ptdf what measures are we truly looking at to encourage um, states most especially the 20 hotspot local government areas on, the, on effective um, contact tracing and sample collection. And um, I would like to know how many patients at the moment we are treating them for that have been treated at home for COVID-19. Thank you very much. Because of the numbers in Lagos, it's not matching. Good afternoon, sirs. My name is Hassan Umar Farouk. I report for Liberty Radio and Television. Uh, my question is to the AZM, sir. In your speech, you emphasize on taking responsibility and ownership of this fight against coronavirus, sir. Isn't the lockdown means transparent such responsibility, which is very enormous to Nigerians, sir? That boils down to the issue of trust. I want to know, sir, what gives you the confidence to relinquish this fight to Nigerians. Thank you very much. The Chairman of the Tax Force, members of the PTF, my colleagues. My name is Amaka Ode, I report for Arise News. And my first question actually goes to the Minister of uh, Health. Um, so medical experts, especially in Lagos, they are claiming that there is a new strain of COVID-19 in the country that kills faster than the initial strain that we had in the country. I'm sure you must have seen the stories flying around, so we need to get your reaction on that story. Then my next question, um, I wish the Minister of Aviation was here, but I can direct that to the National Coordinator. I want to know, um, are we on course, uh, you know, in terms of the plans uh, for opening up the airspace? And, uh, in the coming days, are we likely to see an easing on the restriction of interstate uh, movement and even the curfew? I ask this because, you know, 21st of June is just around the corner, so I want to know where we are in terms of that plan. And the final question actually goes to the chairman of the PTF. This is more of a concern, and um, a group of people need your intervention. Well, in spite of the federal government's directive, uh, through the Nigerian Shippers Council to all shipping lines and terminal operators that imported goods and containers that arrived during the lockdown should not be charged 
demurrage fees. Costco shipping agency and CFAX terminal operator have refused to comply. They are insisting that demurrage be paid before the cargoes are cleared and delivery taken. So that they want to get your reaction to this and also if you can intervene because you had also told us here that during the lockdown those demurrage charges should be dropped. Thank you. Good evening all. My name is Friday Okeribe. I'm a reporter with Channel TV. I'd like to direct my first question to the DG and CDC. Uh, there is this uh, new test kit, RNA SWIFT test kit, that uh, was developed by a Nigerian, Obin Nawonkoji. We heard a report that uh, you've approved it and it's part of the test kits that you are using. We'd like to get a confirmation from you whether this is true or it's another false story that's making the round. Then the second question, I would like the PTF chairman to respond to it. Uh, it has to do with uh, sporting activities. We eased the lockdown or the restrictions on places of worship, even markets are now back. We know that at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, the spread of it, to prevent the spread of it in Nigeria, uh, sporting activities were suspended. One of them was the Nigeria Premier League. Is it time for them to also resume or you are that the PTF is thinking about another time to resume sporting activities in the country. Then I also like the Minister of Health to give uh, us update on um, the Madagascar uh, Herba solution. The agencies that have received the sample for further studies, like the NAVDAC, what update do we have uh, from them? Uh, because this, by my calculation, this is the third week already. The Minister of Education, please. Last two weeks, I asked the question about uh, uh, schools that are not running on our curriculum. These schools are doing online courses for their students. The question now is, can they also conduct online exams for the third term for their students, just for them to catch up with their counterparts, since they are not going to be physically present in classrooms? Can they go ahead and do that? And uh, I think that is uh, about the last one. Yeah, thank you so much. Good evening, sirs. Um, my name is Juliana Taiwabalonia. I write for the Sun newspapers. Um, the coordinator, sir, you've, uh, the last time you did assure us that um, the media, those on essential duty, will not face any harassment from the security operatives. But last night, some of our colleagues face, uh, had a raw deal with them at the border uh, between FCT and Nasarawa. So I want to find out what, uh, what are you going to do to resolve this once and for all with this as security operatives. The SGFs, uh, I don't know, um, we understand that uh, NIPIPs are again planning to go on strike over um, over the implementation, a reduction of workforce and all that, so they're protesting. <laughs> it, it has to do with COVID because they are wondering, they are wondering um, how this is uh, affecting them as well. So the coordinators are, um, in the past 48 hours, I think the SGF can also answer this. Uh, in the past 48 hours, Nigeria has recorded over a thousand cases. With this uh, upsurge in numbers of cases, I mean, is the PTF considering um, advising the president on a total lockdown again? Thank you. Good afternoon, good evening, Chairman and members of the PTF and my colleagues. My name is Mitaire Ikben of the NTA. My first question is to the DG of the NCDC. So if you say that about 80% of uh, cases are, are asymptomatic and uh, with your uh, new discharge protocols recently for asymptomatic patients, which is uh, 10 days after onset of symptoms. One would expect that by now, more than half of uh, our cases would have been discharged. 
Why is this not the case? For the Minister of Health, the cold season usually comes with a lot of respiratory infections like uh, pneumonia and um, others. Is it possible for health workers at this time to mistake some of these infections for COVID-19? And for the PTF chairman, the, NC, this, the NCDC DG says that easing of the lockdown is expected to instigate a rise in COVID-19 cases. And I'm asking that should the pandemic spiral out of control, will there be another lockdown soon? Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman, Nigerians are to my colleagues. My name is Abbas Adebawale Jima from Daily Trust. May I seek the indulgence of the Chairman to pass a comment from a retired military officer in Nigeria. He mentioned some three names, but I'm very sure he will not mind if I pass his message to the entire committee. That was a message of commendation. And he said that he was commending you because he was aware of the consequence of this virus in other countries who have sophisticated health care and they were recording thousands of cases. He also now said that the second reason why he was commending you was for you to add more to your, uh, he used a particular word which is not my phone now, to your dedication, as you are not doing it for yourself, you are doing it for this generation and generation on board. I've passed this message. Thank you, sir. Now, my first question is to the Minister of Health. When the chairman said that the physical and mental health has been added to the treatment of the COVID-19 patients, the physiotherapist and the physicist were also being contacted and because they will claim they don't have some backings like their colleagues. So what is going to happen to the cardiovascular specialist and the physiotherapist, like the mental health were taken care of? Then also was that Nigerians were complaining that they abided by the provision and guideline of this committee and by extension the federal government for over two months, only for them to come out during the ease of the lockdown and the DRTS, also known as the VIO, coming to charge them for expired papers, expired driver license, and they now wonder, well, where would they have gotten the money when they were being at home for two months during those times when the papers had expired? Some of these work were already being impounded and we are in a crisis situation. So they want action, they want some commitment now that everybody can watch at home and add a case. <laughs> now, the, some of the states were also expressing reservation that they might not be able to cope if the federal government completely hands up the issue of management of COVID-19. And they were now asking the NCDCDG what measures would they put in place to reassure Nigerians especially with the comment of the Nigerian Medical Association, even when the federal government is there, the cases kept rising. If you now hand it over to the state, what is going to happen to them? Thank you. What is going to happen is that we, there are certain questions that should be actually, they direct it to someone uh, other than who really uh, is uh, doing that question. So the question of rejecting patients, for example, is a, a hospital services issue. Uh, so it is, it is unethical to reject patients who come to a hospital for treatment. I have said here repeatedly that every person who comes to a hospital must be seen and attended to, and at the least given advice. You give him advice on what to do. If you can't handle it, advise them where to go. Or call transport for them. But to just say go, we don't handle, that is unethical, it's not acceptable. So if that happens anywhere, you have the authority to write to the board, the governing board of that hospital and lay your complaint. Or you can also write to the Ministry of Health. 
or you can write to the State Ministry of Health, if it's a state-owned hospital. If it's a private hospital, you can write to the medical director, or if they have a governing board, you can write there. To express yourself, this is very important because self-correction begins with being uh, pointed, with, with it being pointed out that something was not properly done. So we do receive uh, cases of complaints like that, and we always follow them up. And in cases where it is proven that it is not, uh, uh, there's an infringement on, on the, on the uh, uh, duties of a doctor, it is referred to the medical, medical and Dental Council of Nigeria, and uh, it is well known that they have gone as far as withdrawing licenses of doctors uh, for cases of uh, really serious uh, misbehavior, uh, on, on, on ethical behavior. So what becomes of isolation centers? Yes, that's a very good question, because isolation centers uh, will not always be needed. They will always be needed when there are problems uh, of public health that require isolation. So that's one of the reasons why we are advocating that isolation centers should be within the premises of a tertiary hospital. Let's say within the premise of a university teaching hospital, or within the premise of a federal medical center, or at, the, or at the least the premise of a, a specialty hospital, depending on what you, uh, how much space there is. Uh, the reasons, there are two reasons. First, if someone is in isolation and they develop any kind of complication, you may require doctors from different specialties, not only one. So if you have an isolation center outside town, it usually be one medical officer who is there, and if you have complications, you start looking for where to take the patient to, and that is not a good idea. So if it is within the premise of a tertiary, you can get the specialty that is uh, able to handle it. Now, in the case where there is no isolation, well, it can be converted to other uses, disinfected, and converted to other uses, and then immediately vacated. When this outbreak uh, occurred, not all hospitals in the federal system had isolation center. We told them to evacuate a wing and make that wing ready. So they had to do that. Some of them had to do some real uh, uh, um, space engineering, workspace engineering to make that possible. But if you have a steadily built isolation center, then it can easily be evacuated and converted back to its use. Having said that, I also like to uh, make uh, an appeal that uh, philanthropists and organizations who want to help with building isolation centers need to consult uh, NCDC for the correct design. An isolation center is just not any kind of a house. It has to be designed properly, the spacing, the rooms for the beds, the nurses bay, the consultation room. So NCDC has a correct uh, design for that and this is a design that uh, must be used. And again, not to build it somewhere where it is not accessible, where the full benefit of it cannot be uh, achieved. Now, uh, Basic Health Care Provision Fund, uh, as you know, it was launched earlier by the Excellency the President, and it started operating. And within a few months, the Senate Committee on Health uh, invited the Minister of Health and drew attention to certain areas which they told us were not in uh, in consonance with the Act, and that we needed to correct those ones, and until they are corrected, we should uh, moment halt. So the correction took a bit longer, actually longer than was, was actually expected. But the benefit of it is that something much nicer with a bigger package has emerged. Those errors have been corrected, and we are going to be discussing with the stakeholders now to see about uh, re representing it to the public uh, very soon. But those errors have been corrected, which we were told uh, offended uh, certain sections of the, of the Act, um, so that we have something stronger and more robust. Now, the uh, primary health care centers, whether they're well equipped, well, the primary health care center is perhaps the most important of the infrastructure, uh, infrastructures for addressing basic health care. And as you know, the policy of the government is to have at least one functional primary health care system uh, center in every political ward, which will give us over 9,000, nearly 10,000. Right now, we have about 40 or 45% of them ready. 
But what has also happened in the last few months is that we have made a completely new design of what the primary health care center should look like. I think we'll take a photograph of it and send to you for publication a new design so that even the existing primary health care centers will have to be redesigned that way. And we hope to, we're looking to contact our development partners and agencies that are probably from budget resources to redo and complete the primary health care centers and then the staffing for them to be operational. But there's a very um, comprehensive uh, new approach that gives the assurance that the primary health care center can work around the clock, must be able to deliver service even at night, so that it doesn't open and close like an office. And the uh, citizens can go there when they need help and not be uh, stranded uh, because the, the primary health care has closed for the day. Um, as for the uh, COVID, the strain of COVID-19, yes, when uh, Nigerians were coming back in batches from different countries, from um, the United States, from uh, I think from Saudi Arabia, from, from various countries in Europe, from China, the question did arise, when, and some of them were tested positive for uh, COVID-19, the question did arise whether the strain of COVID-19 they have is the same as the one that was known. As you know, the Nigeria Institute for Medical Research did the genomic sequencing, was the first in Africa to do that, of the virus of the index case that came long ago. And it was confirmed to be the same strain as what was up, circulating in Italy and circulating in China. So we raised the question whether there has been a mutation since then in people coming from other areas. Uh, I don't have any information on that yet, but it is suspected that it's possible. I'm not uh, yet updated, but I'm sure that uh, research centers, particularly uh, uh, the one in uh, Lagos, Yaba, medical research, and the one in uh, Ede, are trying to do a sequencing that will show us whether all these uh, viruses are the same or whether they are different uh, a sequencing. As for the Madagascar herbs, we do not have any new, any information as yet. I have already announced that we give them to our research centers. They are working on them. None of them has reported back yet. Now, the time it takes for uh, all this research is not what we do, but uh, I think when a period has elapsed, I will call them and find out what they have found so far, if they can give me an interim uh, uh, report. Then the question of the cold season, and the, well, it is true that uh, period during Hamatan, uh, you get an increase in upper respiratory tract infection, in Qatar, cough, and so on. So it may be a challenge to start differentiating between that and COVID, but it's good to go to get a history and to advise the patient, put on a mask or give them a mask so that whether it is COVID or uh, ordinary influenza virus or any other kind of virus, there is protection of others. And then uh, carry out the normal diagnosis. Uh, usually the running nose is a common feature of that, inf of that uh, uh, common cold uh, uh, infection and a very heavy productive cough is part of it. Uh, the COVID-19 generally, but not always, generally a dry cough. Uh, so clinicians will have to try and find the difference between the two, but the symptoms can uh, be a little similar. Uh, the issue of mental health, yes, you uh, got it right that we are taking that seriously. The uh, Ministry of Health did do uh, mental health support in the Northeast. In fact, we are still doing it. Uh, the Northeast to set up a program for psychosocial support uh, of victims in the Northeast. Uh, I personally had uh, declared it open in Borno uh, a couple of years ago. So we have experience in providing psychosocial support and there's a plan going on here now to build a protocol for giving psychosocial support to those who are going to be suffering from the after effects uh, or even the effects of uh, COVID-19 infection. I think uh, that's all. Oh, the management of COVID cases, yes. The management of COVID cases is supported by the federal government, by the federal uh, Minister, we support the states. Uh, you have already heard that NCDC provides uh, them with uh, PPEs and, and provides them with equipment, set up, set up a laboratory, 
and uh, 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 the laboratory is uh, functional for diagnostic uh, capacity, but the, and also the, there's a plan to build up isolation centers. But before those are ready, there are other things that can be done only within the state, like providing uh, accommodation for persons who have no symptoms or little symptoms in the, um, maybe in hotels, we have requested that hotels can be rented or the um, um, dormitories can be used, but many hospitals have done very, many, sorry, many states have done very well in that. Some have cleared particular general hospitals and converted them. FCT, for example, has converted the Edu training center into a and distinguished ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen of the press, uh, good afternoon, and let me welcome you all to the national briefing for Monday, the 8th of June, 2020. This briefing is significant because Nigeria on Saturday, 6 June, 2020, reached the milestone of 100 days since the index case was recorded. You will all recall that the index the case was recorded on 27 February 2020. The COVID-19 has taken the entire world by storm because it has disrupted all known systems, including governance, economy, financial system, travels, and healthcare. Even the best of healthcare systems and arrangements succumbed to the force of the virus. Within our national setting, the weaknesses inherent in our national health care systems were made glaring and needed urgent attention. Government determined immediately to take on the lessons and to ensure that the health care system experienced tremendous leap in human and infrastructure development as well as policy focus, stability, and direction. Within the 100 days under review, the following modest accomplishments were recorded. One, the number of laboratories in the COVID-19 network has increased from the bare minimum of two with which the Nigerian Center for Disease Control started with, to 30, with a laboratory in every geopolitical zone in the country providing increased access to testing. Two, over 80,000 tests have been conducted in the country. Over, uh, over 13,000 health workers have been trained, increasing the human resource available for case management, and more personal protective equipment and ventilators have been procured and prepositioned across the country. The number of beds available for isolation and case management has increased from 3,000 beds to about 5,000 beds nationwide. We have developed new guidelines for home care and general case management. And six, we've evacuated over 1,000 Nigerians from different parts of the world while still reviewing the evacuation and quarantine protocols. There has been enhancement in the efficiency of the identification, testing, evacuation, and isolation process for confirmed cases. And nine, we have gradually reopened the economy while balancing between lives and livelihoods. We are working on a mid-term action review in accordance with WHO guidelines, with lessons and recommendations being used to improve the response. We have introduced community engagement and risk communication as critical factors that will help to flatten the curve in a sustainable manner. And 12, We've engaged with development partners and the private sector 
to grow the capacity of the nation in the response. And finally, we continue to introduce several non-pharmaceutical interventions to slow down the spread of the virus. There are several ongoing infrastructure interventions being made by government development partners and the private sector nationwide. The last 100 days has also brought out the best in the spirit of Nigerians. There has been tremendous private sector and corporate mobilization. Similarly, individuals have also sacrificed their little savings for the good of all. What this underscores is the strength of our communal culture and unity in our diversity. The Presidential Task Force thanks everyone for giving hope in the face of a global pandemic, even when humanity seemed helpless. In spite of these accomplishments, Nigeria, like the rest of the world, has witnessed a steady rise in the numbers of infections. As at midnight on Sunday, the 7th June, Nigeria had the following statistics. Confirmed cases were 12,486. Discharged cases, 3,959. And we had a record of fatalities of 354. Based on the trend, science and data as guiding beacons, it has become obvious that Nigeria has entered the community transmission phase. This has significantly helped in identifying the 20 high burden local governments that account for 60% of infections in Nigeria. The Presidential Task Force is already pursuing precision actions on these high burden local governments. It is therefore important for Nigerians to recognize the need to take responsibility and the significant role community ownership and risk communication will play in the future of our national response. Over the last weekend, the ease of restriction on places of worship came into focus. It is important to note that the guidelines give states the latitude and the opportunity to negotiate protocols that meet their peculiarities. We therefore urge our religious leaders and the entire populace to adhere to the guidelines issued by the Presidential Task Force and the protocols agreed by the state governments. The Presidential Task Force will continue to monitor compliance nationwide. The Presidential Task Force wishes to emphasize that a great majority of Nigerians are still susceptible to COVID-19, and if we allow it to transmit easily between us, it may even be more deadly. If everyone diligently observes the guidelines, we can collectively control the spread of the virus and help to protect our health facilities as well as save lives. On 6 June 2020, the Presidential Task Force also visited the National Reference Laboratory to witness firsthand the processes for testing. Experience, as it is, it is said, is the best teacher. We can confirm that the process is rigorous, thorough, and demanding. From the laboratories to the nurses, to our doctors and other medical personnel, an enormous sacrifice is being made by these dedicated Nigerians. Ladies and gentlemen, I have considered it important to reiterate the appreciation of the entire nation to all our frontline workers who toil around the clock to ensure that we remain safe in this country. The visit has revealed the huge responsibilities shouldered by these young and committed professionals 
as well as the risk that they face on a daily basis. The visit also enabled the Presidential Task Force to listen to challenges faced at the National Reference Lab and to recognize such challenges as opportunities because they represent motivations for action. The shortage of reagents and supply chain issues are global issues because the entire world is seeking to purchase the same commodities. To the Presidential Task Force, the motiv motivation for action is to look for inward, plan ahead, and develop our domestic capacities. This is because COVID-19 is neither the first nor will it be the last pandemic. What is certain is that we must not allow the next pandemic to catch us unprepared. The strategic trust of the national response is to test, test and test. However, the visit to the National Reference Laboratory has shown that while we ramp up capacity for testing, we must also enhance the skills and size of manpower to run the laboratories. Moving from two to a network of 30 technology-driven laboratories and coordinating them is certainly not a small feat. It is therefore significant to mention that a major outcome of the 100 days assessment is the recognition of the need for states to scale up responsibility for their public health response in the medium to long term. We hope to build a network of state public health labs that will bring about sustainability in public health response in Nigeria. Since the commencement of our national response, a lot of priority has been given to physical health management of people who are affected. I am pleased to inform you that the Presidential Task Force has commenced the process of integrating comprehensive psychological services program into its activities. This will be for the benefit of people who are in isolation, well-being of their families and the communities. In this regard, we wish to recognize the Federal Medical Center Jabi FCT for spearheading this drive, which shall inevitably assume a national dimension because of the importance of mental health. As we mark the 100 days after the index case, we remember all Nigerians who have passed away from this disease. We commiserate with their families and friends who have had to deal with the difficulty of losing loved ones at this time. We pray that God will continue to console them and heal our land. At this juncture, ladies and gentlemen, the Presidential Task Force appreciates the World Health Organization, the African Center for Disease Control, the West African Health Organization, the United Nations Family, the European Union, and a host of other partners for the support we have received so far. Finally, I wish to state that in the absence of a vaccine, Nigeria and the rest of the world must depend on public health social measures, and supportive management of confirmed cases. We urge all Nigerians to take individual and collective responsibility by adhering to public health advice, such as frequent hand hygiene through hand washing or use of alcohol-based sanitizers, use of face masks in public places, and observance of physical or social distancing of at least two meters apart. I now call 
on the Honorable Minister of Health, the DG Nigerian Center for Disease Control, and the National Coordinator to update you before we take your questions for today. I thank you for listening. Have a good evening. The complete new uh, treatment center for COVID uh, and uh, the, the, their donations from the private sector like the dome here in Abuja also. And, and, and the hospitals that uh, they converted, I think Karo also, Karo Hospital also to the same purpose. And I recently opened, uh, we declared open such a hospital in uh, Doe State where the governor cleared one hospital and just prepared it for COVID. So there are many states who are taking that example and the federal government supports them with uh, various uh, uh, needs that are identified. So it's a two-way game where the states uh, actually are in lead, taking the lead. If they are short of doctors, they also look, uh, call up uh, for support in that. And in case they require intensive care doctors, we are participating in trying to train uh, intensive care doctors when, if and when the need arises for the states. So, <clears throat> thank you very much. Just a few questions. Uh, Rachel Altes per day, uh, thereabouts, sometimes a little bit less. Um, <clears throat> over the last two days, we've activated um, uh, a new lab in Oyo by the University of Ibadan, the University College Ibadan, the University College, which is part of the University of Ibadan, actually, affiliated with the University Teaching Hospital. So a lot of work going on. Uh, Ondo, the Lassa Fever Lab, is just being converted to COVID right now. Jigawa, like I said, Ekiti. So there's a lot of work going on. However, you, if you read the CITREP today, you'd have seen the release of the monthly testing numbers. It should have been released yesterday, but there was a delay. So I, we really need the press, um, gentlemen of the press, to really use these numbers to advocate uh, to the state governments. You know, that's really where the testing, the collection of samples happens. Right now we have, uh, our labs are working at 10 to 20 percent of capacity, right? So we have the capacity to test a lot more. We can test about 10,000 samples per day, probably more if we were pushed hard. So the labs are there, the samples are not coming as sufficiently as we want. So we really ask over this weekend, every state to push harder. We've been pushing with the state epidemiologists and every, the only way we can know whether we're on top of this is really by testing. And we are ready to do that. Uh, gene expert uh, labs uh, locations will start functioning on the 14th of June. We've been working very hard over the past two weeks to distribute the cartridges to the first uh, seven centers to train them to make sure they're ready. So on the 14th of June, they start testing. So a lot of work has gone on to build the capacity of our labs and that will continue until every state is able to test uh, in their state. So the challenge now is we are challenging the states, leading the contact tracing, leading the case identification to bring in the sample so that we can collectively know how close we are to the peak. Um, uh, Friday, I think uh, your question, I just made a note of it. I'm going to look at that particular um, PCR test. There are lots of PCR reagents that we're bringing into the system now, so I'll get an answer back to you. Mitare, I think um, on the new discharge uh, protocol, yes, th there's a big challenge around some of the historic cases uh, that some of them were never found, right? Some of them were, you know, uh, we've s talked about this severally. We have a positive test. We try your phone number. We can't reach you. We go and look for you. We can't find you. And so it's very hard uh, to discharge you if, we, <laughs> if you were never brought into care. So, but we will have to make a decision with the states uh, after some time how much effort is reasonable in terms of looking for every individual uh, case. So there are quite a number of historical cases that can't be discharged at the moment because they never actually entered the system even though they were positive. But at some point, uh, we have to define them as unfound, uh, create a new category maybe and move on with that. But it's a very good question. It shows that you're looking at our data and thinking very carefully. So thank you very much. Um, the last question was about um, handing over the response to the states. Um, when we say we are calling on the states to take more responsibility, 
It's not that we're abdicating on our own responsibility. Health remains on the concurrent list in the Federation. It means that we continue to have a responsibility. Between last weekend and today, we have carried out the biggest distribution of PPEs ever since the response started. Enough to take every state, every FMC, every teaching hospital for about a month. Just the distribution of it was a logistics miracle on its own. Uh, packing it, getting uh, it ready, counting, recounting, making sure it gets to the facility, doing the accountability, getting the results back. And I think the last batch is going out today because we wanted to get it out before the uh, public holiday tomorrow. So we continue to support the states. Everything we're doing is to support the states. So we're not abdicating our responsibility towards the states. We just uh, want them to take more responsibility. And to be honest, we are seeing that happen. Uh, many of these labs I mentioned, Jigawa, Ekiti, are all efforts by the state governments to accelerate the efforts themselves. And so we will continue working hand in hand with all our state governments to improve the response across the country. Thank you. Encourage states on contact tracing, particularly as it relates to the 20 local government areas that are hotspots. Well, we continue to work very closely with the states. Um, just this morning, I, I had a phone call with the Kano State uh, Emergency Operations Center lead, the, the incident manager, to discuss how things were going along in terms of the house-to-house -house, um, uh, testing that they are doing. Um, we are also working with the uh, rest of the states. We actually have a host of strategies that we are currently planning that we hope to launch beyond just contact tracing increasing testing in these local governments, uh, making sure that there are community isolation centers uh, linked to them, uh, making sure that there are treatment centers that are functional. Um, we've already put a lot of resources into risk communication and community engagement. Uh, just a few days ago, we had a, a meeting with stakeholders uh, organized by the Honorable Minister of the FCT, where we met all the religious um, uh, leaders within the FCT and also the, the traditional rulers as well as the chairs of the, uh, of the area councils because we are really pushing towards uh, greater community engagement and this is particularly more relevant to the areas that are um, hotspots. So we continue to do that work. In terms of your question about case management, you wanted to know the numbers. Case management is actually handled by uh, the Federal Ministry of Health. So I will uh, push that back to, to, to health. I don't have the numbers, I'm afraid. It's, uh, it's handled by health. Um, the other issue regarding journalists uh, facing a raw deal, harassment with security operatives, etc. Actually, just a few days ago, we, we had a meeting where the commissioner of police for FCT was there. And again, I emphasized the need to ensure that those that are on essential duty are allowed free movement. We have said this over and over again. Um, we will re write to the IG of police again to raise the issue. Um, I believe journalists, particularly those here, will probably have passes. If you don't have passes, just reach out to us and we'll, we'll see how we can arrange for that. Because if you have a pass and you have an ID card, there's absolutely no reason why you should be stopped um, um, by, by police unless it's for another reason, but certainly not from the perspective of um, the curfew. Um, airspace, well, what we said to the aviation authorities is, you need to let us know from the 21st of June onwards if you are ready to start opening the skies. We didn't say 21st of June, skies open. We gave them a window of three weeks to prepare, and I believe they are still preparing. Uh, we didn't ask them for um, regular updates in terms of how things are going. We expect them to come back to us. There are, as you know, the aviation industry is highly regulated. There are certain things that they have to do before they start flying, such as retraining of pilots, um, recalibrating the aircrafts, um, and ensuring safety across the board, as well as the measures we need to impose um, at the airports to make sure that people are safe. So, no, we don't have an update for that. We, we expect them to come back to us by the 21st of June. And if they come back to us and say they are ready from the 21st of June onwards, we will open the skies for domestic uh, travel. And uh, that's when we will address the issue of uh, interstate 
uh, restrictions and uh, curfews. But for the moment, there's no, there's no plan right now to say 21st of June, here we go. Um, so it's aspirational, if anything. Um, the last one has to do with, um, is the PTF considering a total lockdown, considering the number of cases we've been having over the last few days. So um, as DG and CDC said, the number of cases we have is a reflection of the number of tests we do. Uh, for those of you who look at the NCDC numbers very carefully, if you look at the positivity rate, it's, it still remains about 10 to 15 percent of the tests that we do that come up positive. So if you do more tests, you're going to find more. When we say there are 13,000 Nigerians with COVID, that's a minimum. It doesn't mean that there are, there are only 13,000 um, Nigerians with COVID. No. It means those were the ones that we have been able to diagnose as positive. Um, even with the situation we are in, we are monitoring very carefully. Um, nothing is um, off the table. Um, we, still have, we still have options available. We will continue to work very closely with the community because we've now gone into a community transmission phase. We know that the only thing that will stop this pandemic, the only thing that will stop this pandemic is behavior change because there's no vaccine, there's no preventive therapy. And therefore, we have to continue to work right down at the community level to engage people and ensure that people have an understanding of the risks of um, their behavior and um, they are complying with the guidelines. We will continue to monitor this very carefully, but it's also a reflection of the number of tests we do. We are not surprised that the numbers have gone up because the, num the number of tests we are doing has significantly gone up. A few days ago, we almost reached 4,000 tests per day. We had about 3,900 tests, and um, that's significant compared to our previous tests. So uh, just watch the space, and we'll continue to monitor and see how things go. Thank you. What's your question about Lagos State, uh, Rachel? Sorry? OK. Okay. So um, I think NCDC, th there's definitely data available on CITREP, but um, it's the availability of beds varies across states. Um, um, we can provide you with that data. I know about 80% of those that are positive in the country are currently being managed outside uh, isolation facilities. That's the sort of figure we have. Um, but different states, some states have, have a lot of capacity in terms of beds. I know Kano, Lagos, they have run out of beds. A few of the other states are red. We actually have a line listing, an amber-colored listing of states that are in the red where you have more positive cases than beds available. But we also have states that have very few cases and have a lot of isolation capacity. We cannot move patients around from one state to the other. So obviously, if you run out of cases, Lagos, for instance, they have um, almost five, six times the number of cases that Kano, which is the second state, that second state in terms of numbers has. So of course, you're going to have a lot more people contributing to that proportion of 80%. Thank you. Okay, but your question was about um, harassment by security agencies. Um, as far as we know, journalists are allowed free movement because they are doing essential duties. Thank you. Yes, the question as to schools that operate a foreign or run a foreign program in Nigeria and whether they can go ahead and test for their own term exams, uh, truly they should and they can. Uh, most of the schools who have that permit or who run such programs, basically only in Lagos and Abuja, um, are directed really towards um, 
embassies and people who have foreign nationals in Nigeria all of this while. So norm normally those schools, the American school, Regent, a few of the uh, private schools that have that content, they are tailored really to satisfy the ability of some of the children of expats who live here so that when they return to their countries, they'll be able to rejoin their own school system. That's why they were, that's what their license included in the first place. I've heard stories that we have asked that they should not. They, what we said is what PTF has said. No movement, no return to classes. But we have not said people should stop learning. I'm encouraging everybody to try and learn. And if such schools are able to host online classes for the curriculum that they operate, and they choose to use the period to cover their syllable, it is permitted from the exam body that they also ascribe to, to then conclude those schemes. It would not be proper for us to now say, wherever you are in your village or in your room or wherever your person is, you cannot issue him exams. It won't make any sense. Thank you very much. Most of the questions have been answered. Uh, the issue of rejection, I am glad uh, the Honorable Minister of Health has made it quite explicit that it is uh, uh, unprofessional uh, for somebody to refuse to attend uh, to somebody that is in distress uh, as a result of his medical condition. Uh, for that facility to turn them back, uh, I think uh, uh, our advice did not say you turn them back. Don't manage them if you are not certified to do that or you have, you have not received accreditation to manage them. But in terms of uh, uh, the preliminary investigations, uh, 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 we never stop that from being undertaken. And I'm glad that the Honorable Minister has dealt with that quite effectively because some of the hospitals that were mentioned uh, by AIT correspondent are government-owned institutions and they are there to serve that particular purpose. And the, the National Hospital in Abuja has a whole wing we visited it. It has a whole wing that is dedicated to COVID-19 with uh, uh, even an intensive care unit attached to uh, the wing. Liberty, what gives me the confidence uh, to uh, ask Nigerians to take responsibility? I haven't seen the level of uh, compliance. At this moment, I have no choice. We've gotten to the stage that every Nigerian must take responsibility. Because what we are trying to do is for everybody to take ownership of how he or she navigates this entire pandemic process to stay alive and to survive it. The best that government can do in this circumstance is to in place the guidelines, working with the subnational entities, with our community leaders, with our religious leaders, and all forms of informal leadership, so that the ownership is now transferred because the business has moved from where it used to be to the communities. And unless as individuals and collectively as a community we take responsibility and we own the process, it will be difficult to navigate it. Watching the news on CNN these last two days, 
was quite scary. The American health officials, either the Center for Disease Control or Director for Infectious Diseases, uh, standing up front on television and telling the American people that the, to the death toll will be about 200,000 by September. That's the fact by the projections of what they see and the death rates on a daily basis. That is what has informed those conclusions. And basically what the officials are doing is that, yes, there's this much government can do. But two, the people have a responsibility. And they continue to drive home the point that even if beaches are open, other facilities, shopping malls are open, you have to take personal responsibility to ensure that when you step out of your house, there are certain things that you are expected to do, to wear your mask, to maintain social distancing, to keep your hands sanitized or washed and avoid big gatherings, which are incubators for very easy infection. In that, the responsibility is not theirs of the official. The responsibility is for those that are stepping out of their houses to do these things that have been listed, to adhere by these guidelines. It's the same. It's the same. If the U.S., with every strength in its economy, in its health system, can be given a projection of 200,000 deaths. September is just down the line. We're talking about three months. And I'm worried if as a people and as a nation, we don't see this. So the truth about it is that there is this much government can do, but the responsibility has now been ceded to the Nigerian people. When you leave your house every day, you will be conscious of the fact that I have a responsibility to do whatever I am assigned to do outside my house and return home without an infection. Government cannot guarantee that. But you can walk diligently to ensure that it does not happen. So uh, that's my confidence, that Nigerians are resilient. Nigerians are very hopeful people. Even in the midst of the difficulties, we don't easily give up. We have this strong spirit of survival. And that is what I want Nigerians to hold on to and ensure that that strong spirit of survival takes them through these very difficult times where a small virus has disrupted their social and our communal life. Sporting activities, uh, channels did ask whether sporting activities can resume. Well, the, like the Premier League and the rest, I'm not sure we are excited about opening up for sporting activities. Knowing fully well that sporting activities in our country, particularly the game of soccer, attracts large crowds. If our guideline says that large gatherings are banned except, I mean, not to exceed 20 people except for places of work, I don't see the excitement that will be achieved if we allow sporting activities, particularly soccer like the Premier League, to resume in an empty stadium. A lot of 
the European countries where these games are big businesses have started looking at the prospects of returning to the pitches. But they are doing it in a deliberate and a very, very slow-paced manner. And most countries are saying that when they finally resume, it will be teams playing in empty stadia or stadium. Who will get there to? But for now, we are concerned with the few activities that we have allowed to resume. And we have given ourselves one month within which to do a thorough assessment and see how we fare. That ties it to the question of whether with the increase we are seeing, whether there will be a review of the ease of lockdown. The question is we had indicated in my first address on this subject that we would study the situation, look at it, and see how we are going. And if there is need for review, that review will be advised by data, by science, by experiences of other jurisdictions, and by uh, the peculiarities of our environment. To go back to a total lockdown must be taken in the context of what do we desire to achieve after we've locked down for about five weeks and seen how we fared. So I, the, 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 the issue of review might not have that in contemplation because you can't move forward and begin to move backwards again uh, in terms of uh, strategic implementation of our policies uh, we might not be looking towards that direction but we might be looking at how to strengthen what we have put in place how to ensure compliance and all other non-pharmaceutical interventions that we have put in place. As to whether shipping companies still charge demorage, I tried to get across to the Executive Secretary of the Shippers Council, who was coordinating that in the earlier stages of this response, to see if there has been a change of policy. Uh, I was unable to reach him, but I believe I will reach him over this weekend. And uh, at the next uh, session of briefing, I should be able to bring you up to date on what is the current policy. As the COVID-19 virus is changing is in, its, in its characteristics and mutation, uh, our policies are following the, uh, the I mean, uh, behind and trying to change. I think the most important thing that we will take home today is that as we celebrate June 12, our new Democracy Day, I want Nigerians to take to heart that this is really a challenging time. And like I said in my address, we must be sober and reflective as we celebrate the 12th of June as our new Democracy Day. You must have gotten the news alert. Mr. President will be addressing the nation tomorrow at 7 a.m. I believe he will bring words of comfort and words of encouragement to our people and expressions of gratitude to all of you that have stepped up in assisting the government to overtake and respond quite effectively to the COVID-19 pandemic. But what is expected of us as a people? I believe we have very, very critical role to play. And I, my appeal to all Nigerians 
is that we must do everything to ensure that we protect ourselves, protect our loved ones, protect our families, protect our community, and by extension, protect our nation. These are challenging times, these are difficult times. And it is only when we work collaboratively and in one accord that we will be able to overcome the difficulties that is confronting the entire world, not only Nigeria. This pandemic, like I keep saying, has exposed the weaknesses of our system. But the beauty about it is that as Nigerians, we are resolved. And that came out strongly in the interaction we had with the ad hoc committee of the House of Representatives, that we will not lose the gains of the experiences of managing COVID-19. And I believe that our health infrastructure and our social net, social safety net system will come out much stronger by the time it is all said and done. So I wish you a happy Democracy Day and a very long weekend. We'll see you during the next briefing. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, they are all matters of policy. I don't know how that policy came about. And unless I speak to the operators of that policy, I won't be able to give you an accurate uh, response. And that I'm going to do for the goods that came in during the lockdown. What is the pro policy as regards payment of demorage? That's what you want to know. We will find out for you and we will convey uh, the appropriate uh, answer. And if there are difficulties, we are all in this together. It is intended that we find resolutions to all the matters. Thank you. For today. But before we go, a lot of reminders have come out of today's session. Uh, COVID-19, as a, as a significant public health challenge facing our nation in modern times, has woven its way into our social consciousness in very many ways. We should, therefore, give no room for complacency, for stigmatization, and for doubts about the potency of this virus, no matter the face of our relaxed uh, lockdown. As we go about our daily living, therefore, let us remember that the simplest and cheapest way of protecting ourselves is to mask up and observe all the measures that have been put in place. But before we go, finally, let us recognize that we should mark the Democracy Day tomorrow in a reflective manner, in a very sober manner. We must resolve to change our behavior, take responsibility, collaborate with public health officials, translate knowledge to action by creating awareness. We wish you a very pleasant Democracy Day tomorrow. God bless Nigeria. We hope to see you on Monday by the grace of God.